Well, good morning. We are continuing in our series through the book of Galatians today. And so if you have your Bibles, you could turn to Galatians chapter 2. I will, of course, uh, read our text as typical and then uh, pray for us and then we'll get into it. And just as a reminder, this is the Word of God. Then, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. I went up according to a revelation and presented to them the gospel I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to those recognized as leaders. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus in order to enslave us. But we did not give up and submit to these people for even a moment, so that the truth of the gospel would be preserved for you. Now from those recognized as important, what they once were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to me. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter was for the circumcised. Since the one at work in Peter for an apostleship to the circumcised was also at work in me for the Gentiles. When James, Cephas, and John, those recognized as pillars, acknowledged the grace that had been given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to me and Barnabas, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They only asked that we would remember the poor, which I had made every effort to do. Let me pray for us. Father God, I thank you for your enduring word, as it states here, that we agree to the word, that we all are in one accord with what Scripture says. And I thank you, Lord, that it has been preserved for over 2,000 years, and we can rely on this. Father God, I thank you so much for that. And I pray, Lord, that you just encourage and equip your church to be, re to be united around the gospel of grace. We thank you and pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't know. It's fastly approaching September, and that means we're kind of just about getting into the fall season. And everyone's favorite fall holiday is coming up, Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving, we do what? We oftentimes, we get together with our family members. And what does sometimes, or I should say, a lot of times happen at those family gatherings? Arguments, right? <laughs> Some of us have, have dreaded family gatherings that we don't exactly look forward to because we're maybe afraid. Like, I really don't want to have to attend another family gathering where there's going to be squabbling and bickering and arguing. Done that. And this is a sad reality for many of us. And yet, I think the deeper issue in that kind of uh, idea of a family gathering that is disunity, that the, dis, the, the deeper issue is that that community, that family should be united. I mean, they are, they are blood. And this is kind of exactly what Paul is going to get at here, is deeper issues within a community of believers with the, with the Galatians and how the Galatians need to be united and what they unite around. Now, again, the, the biblical setting here, we know that there's churches in the region of Galatia here, and they face these challenges. These false brothers were coming in, and they were preaching something contrary to the gospel of grace. And two weeks ago when I was here, uh, we had heard Paul's warning that an attempt to distort the gospel is an attempt to destroy the gospel. So this is a very serious issue going on. And yet we see this, this timeless relevance, 2,000 years. This book is 2,000 years old, and we still struggle today with the issues that they face in Scripture, one of disunity. 
And so I wanted you, you to consider a couple of questions this morning. The first question I'd like you to consider is, are we truly united in the gospel of grace? And the second question is, are we diligent to identify distortions that may erode our unity? Okay, so the two questions, are we truly united in the gospel of grace, and are we diligent to identify distortions that may potentially erode our unity? And as we explore those questions uh, from this passage this morning in Galatians, we, we are going to see that unity in the gospel is achieved when we commit to living and dying by the gospel of grace. So unity in the gospel is achieved when we commit to living and dying in the gospel of grace. Look at what he says in verse 1. He says, Then, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. I went up according to a revelation and presented to them the gospel I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to those recognized as leaders. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running in vain. He, he went up again, it says, meaning he, he went up a previous time. This is referencing Acts chapter 15, where there was a dispute in Antioch. And there, the, the Pharisees, they were saying, you must be circumcised and you must obey the full law in order to be a follower of Christ. Those things are necessary. And so the issue there in Acts chapter 15, it went before the, the elders or the overseers and it went before the, uh, the apostles to try and get clarification. And James, he quoted the Old Testament. And he said, the gospel of grace is open to both Jew and to Gentile. Peter would go on to argue that, uh, he would go on to say, quote, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks that they were not able to bear? Both Jew and Gentile are saved the same way by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And upon hearing those arguments, the, the elders and the overseers and the apostles there, they decided unanimously. And they said, quote, it was the Holy Spirit's decision and ours not to place further burdens on you beyond these requirements, abstain from food offered to idols, from blood, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. So in essence, what the, the elders there and the apostles there were saying is, you don't have to follow the law. You don't have to follow, you don't have to be circumcised. You have to follow Jesus. Because Jesus fulfilled the law. And this was a, a monumentous decision in the life of the early church. And it reminded me of, of what the, the, refor the reformers fought for in the 1500s. And we see a couple of the, the solas, if you're familiar with that. By grace alone, and faith alone, and Christ alone. And this is exactly what the, the elders and the apostles were arguing for. Not for this additional requirement for believers to fulfill. And yet this time, Paul talks about going up again. So he goes up and he goes privately to them. To determine if what he was preaching is in vain. Is the gospel of grace truly for Gentiles? I mean, you've got you to imagine this. There's tension going on in the churches there, in the region of Galatia. There's basically two warring factions. It's, it's the Hatfields and the McCoys. And the, it was those who held firmly to the gospel of grace and those who were adding to the gospel. And Paul felt that unity... And the gospel was essential. That's why he went to the leaders there. But he felt unity in the gospel was essential. And it brings forth our first truth for the morning. That commitment to the gospel of grace strengthens our unity. Commitment to the gospel of grace strengthens our unity. There's, there's something that we definitely need to get right. And it's a consistent message of the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace is our foundation for what we believe. 
and the key to our unity. And when this foundation of the gospel of grace, when that is solid and affirmed, it unites a church. It unites believers. The analogy that I came up with was that of a uh, building. You build a house on a strong foundation, and it's not going anywhere. And the church remains strong when it's built on the foundation of the unchanging gospel. It's nearly impossible. It's nearly impossible for, for everyone in the entire church to be united around a program, around an event, around fellowship. It's just impossible. Or I should say nearly impossible. Around a style of music. And so we remind ourselves where we are called to be united in the gospel of grace. Our unity as a church is only as strong as our shared commitment is to that gospel. I want to talk for a second about the role of doctrine. Ugh. We hate that word, right? Doctrine. Doctrinal clarity, though, it actually protects the church. It prevents division in a church. Because you know going in where the church stands. I mean, could you imagine if the church believed one thing and uh, maybe a group of believers believed something else? It just wouldn't go well. So doctrinal clarity actually prevents division. Because people would know where we stand as a church. Philippians 1.27 says, Stand firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. It's a shared commitment to the gospel. And this has very practical implications for us as a church body. Unity shapes how we interact with one another. You know, we had gone through that series in the, uh, the One Another series a while back. Right? which talks about how we love one another, how we serve one another, how we submit to one another. And so our unity in the gospel, and the gospel tells us how we're to do those things, how we're to interact with, with one another. Unity in the gospel also tells us how we are called to make decisions. It should not be the, the, a sole pastor making all the decisions in the world for the church, life of the church. It just shouldn't. The Moses model is not a good model. It tells us also that in terms of how we make decisions, but also how we you know, approach ministry. And that's why we take a look at ministry and, and how we're doing ministry. Because we need ministry, whatever ministry efforts we're doing, to be united around the gospel of grace. And if it's not, we, we've kind of missed the mark on that. So everything we do needs to be united in the gospel. And these are some of the practical implications of that. And this morning, and moving forward, we have an opportunity. And the opportunity is to confirm the gospel of grace, just like Paul did when he went to the leadership. And to recognize that our strength our church is strengthened when we're united. And that also strengthens our witness to South Cumberland and even beyond. So this is really important that we get this right. Look at what he says actually in verse 3. He says, But not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus, in order to enslave us. But we did not give up and submit to these people for even a moment so that the truth of the gospel would be preserved for you. Greeks or Gentiles did not become circumcised. They just didn't do it. And he's saying here that Titus and himself, they stood firm. Titus stood firm, right? Titus said, I am not going to do that. I'm not going to be forced into that. 
And the problem really was that these false brothers had come there and they were dishonestly teaching and trying to persuade to do something. And it was contrary to the gospel of grace. And this was a big issue. And the, the way the Greek is written here, it's they had purposefully intended to do this. They had set out to do that. And what they were trying to do was just absolutely terrible. Because I think I'd given the analogy, again, maybe two weeks back, but the analogy of when you know, someone was in the jail cell and then they go out into this beautiful, wonderful field and then they turn out from that field and they go back into the jail cell. And that represents the freedom we have in Christ. And then when we turn from that, we become enslaved again. And this is exactly what the false brothers there were trying to do. They were trying to enslave Titus and others. They tried to get them to trade freedom for slavery. But you notice what Paul and Titus do. They do not yield to that. They don't submit to that false gospel that's being preached to the churches in that region. All in an effort that the gospel of grace would be preserved. There's this idea that you know, the gospel of grace is passed down from generation to generation, and, and look what we've got today. Because those dear brothers stood firm. This would be a completely different book if they were compelled and if they had truly tor- uh, turned their back and had undergone circumcision. But they stood firm. They stood firm in the gospel. And Paul's getting at the fact of my second point is that a pure gospel is essential for spiritual health. A pure gospel is essential for spiritual health. The gospel is a precious truth, but one that must be guarded and preserved in its purest form. I want you to think about it like water. My wife and I, we, we've gone to a number of Central and South American countries on mission trips and stuff like that. I remember one time we went to Peru and we had to leave a little bit earlier than the rest of the group. The rest of the group went to Machu Picchu. But guess what? <laughs> the rest of the group got sick after drinking some water. And if you were to have a glass of water and you were to bring it to the tap and you were to fill that cup with water and it's maybe a little cloudy, maybe it smells a little strange and you drink it, what's gonna happen? If you're, especially if you're a third world country, you're probably gonna get sick. And just as pure water is essential for our physical health, so too is a pure gospel essential for our spiritual health. We need that Brita gospel, just the good stuff, that pure, unadulterated gospel, and to hold firm to that. There's some dangers to distorting the gospel. It can lead people away from the truth. It can lead them into slavery again. It can cause division. It can weaken the church's witness. And so we guard against distortions by being discerning. I think Marty had mentioned this last week about, you know, read the word, study the word, talk to each other about doctrinal questions you might have, engage in discussions, and be willing to confront false teachers if they are preaching something contrary to the gospel. I was thinking about my dumb phone this week. You guys have dumb phones? Uh, I, don't blame me, I like Apple products, okay, don't, don't send me hate emails and don't come up with me after, but I, li- I enjoy Apple products. Apple is known for their quality and their design f- features. Uh, their products go through a very rigorous set of tests before they reach us, and they, they test millions upon millions to see to determine it. Is something wrong with the design element here? Is something wrong with the operating system here? And similarly, Paul and the apostles, they need to, and we need to, reject any distortion of the gospel. We need to protect its purity, its beauty. 
And we're all called. We're all called to this. We're all called to ensure the gospel is preached from this pulpit. We're all called to ensure that the gospel is taught and lived out, lived out and safeguarded and safeguard its integrity. This is all of our job responsibility under job responsibility for Christians. And look what Paul says, though, continuing in verse 6. He says, Now from those recognized as important, what they once were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to me. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter was for the circumcised. Since the one at work in Peter for an apostleship to the circumcised was also at work in me for the Gentiles. When James, Cephas, and John, those recognized as pillars, acknowledged the grace that had been given to me, they gave me the right hand of fellowship to me and Barnabas, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They only asked that we would remember the poor, which I made every effort to do. Those recognized as important, the, the pillars as he calls them. And he says their, their position, it, it wasn't really that their position was important. And that kind of reminded me of what I had preached on here, again, a couple, two weeks ago, about how Paul thought it was of premier importance to please God over pleasing men. And Paul, it seems like he's continuing that same vein of thought here. But he says, they didn't add anything to me. Meaning, he was preaching what he was called to preach. He was preaching the gospel of grace. They didn't add anything. He was told it was consistent. The message he was consistent was the same as for the Jew as for the Gentile, the uncircumcised to the circumcised. It was the same message, just a different messenger. They gave him like the, the stamp of approval. What you're doing, Paul? is good, is pure. And so the apostles and the, the elders, the pillars there, they, they embrace Paul. Paul, once called Saul, into the fellowship. They accepted him as a brother in Christ. Think about the significance of that. This would have been such an encouraging meeting Again, remember, he was once Saul, he, he literally, the uh, book of Acts tells us, he literally ripped men from their households and he would torture them and chain them up. He would sign the death warrant for people. He would okay the stoning of Stephen. That same guy, they said, yeah, you're preaching the, the gospel of grace. This new believer Paul of Tarsus preached the gospel of grace and was welcomed into the family with open arms. I was actually thinking of inviting one of my kids up to do the, the right hand of fellowship and we come up with this like really cool, you know, whatever kind of thing, but um, I would have ruined it. But the final point here that I wanted to bring up is that embracing a shared mission enhances our witness to the gospel of grace. Embracing a shared mission enhances our witness to the gospel of grace. We here are called to be united around the gospel of grace and the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Amen? And I want to go through a couple of dangers of, of disunity, though. Matthew 12 says, A house divided cannot stand. The, the, the Blanchard Standard Version would say something to the effect of a church divided cannot stand. Unity is essential for strength of the church. Disunity, it weakens our witness, it leads to church splits and church division, it leads to ineffective mission, it causes internal conflicts, uh, just a mess. It causes confusion. It dilutes the gospel message. Then the gospel's impact. If we have here 20, 30 people who all have different agendas, it's just going to create confusion. 
is just going to weaken our efforts to reach out to the people we all love and care about in this community. And we got to get we got to get united on this page, dear church. And there's such a power, there's such power in a shared mission. When we have a united purpose, a shared mission that the whole church can get behind. That strengthens our gospel witness in South Cumberland and to the ends of the world. Not even the gates of hell will prevail against a united church. A united church becomes powerful. It becomes an attractive witness to the community, to others, where the goal of making maturing disciples of Christ is first and foremost, and it represents a church that cannot be stopped. And there's practical implications for us as well. I know there's going to be more discussion on this, uh, definitely more next week and in the weeks following. Uh, but the Fostering Council has been working for the past year. Very hard. I know they've been working very hard. Countless hours upon hours. Like a ton of hours. <laughs> They've been working on trying to, to come up with and trying to create that, un, you, uh, that united front to create a culture of, that's grounded in Scripture, that's grounded in the Gospel, from the Constitution all the way down. This has been their goal. And we, as the Church of Second Baptist, we are called to embrace a shared mission that the Fostering Council is attempting to work on. Now, you might say, well, why is that important? Because unity in mission leads to un an unstoppable and effective witness to the gospel. Being united is a good thing. It makes the church strong. People will be attracted to that. I was thinking of a little history. Uh, World War II, perhaps we've got some World War II buffs in here. But after World War II, some European countries, they basically decided to band together to form the European Union. And they did that to uh, you know, prevent future conflict, maybe potentially World War III. And when they were doing so, they developed common policies and economic standards and cooperating agreements. You've got to understand that each member nation, they have their own language. They, I'm sure they have their own self-interest. And yet somehow, some way, they were able to reach a consensus and come together. And the, the apostles and Paul, they achieved a very similar thing. They achieved a united understanding of the gospel message and its importance. And they understood their mission. This one is going to speak to the Jew, to, to, the, to the uncircumcised, and this one to the circumcised. We're on the same goal. We're on the same mission. And we are called to do that very same thing. To be united and in agreement with the gospel message. I look at the Galatian church and I see that those churches were not united. They were turning to a different gospel. And this morning we, we do. We have a chance to reflect on what Christ has done for us and in Christ how we've been united, we've been brought together by his sacrifice on the cross that he made for all of us here. And barriers that would seek to divide us have been torn down when he did that. He is, Christ is our peace, and whom we are united to. And in doing so, we're united to each other. Unity in Christ, though, is not something that we just passively enjoy. We have to work towards it. It's something we actively pursue. And this is why, folks, this is why, this is why confirming the gospel is so essential. 
It's so crucial. It fortifies our unity in grace. And when we guard against distortions, it preserves the purity of our faith. It strengthens our own faith. We, we, you know, we stop doubting God. We stop doubting his word. And it also ensures that we remain rooted in the true gospel. And as we embrace this shared mission, it, it strengthens our witness as we stand united in what Christ has accomplished on the cross for all of us, for, for this entire church. There's one other thing, though, that I wanted you to be aware of. And that is that Christ gave all of us here the ministry of reconciliation. And he empowers you. He empowers us to seek out those who we've been estranged from. Just like that illustration I gave before of the Thanksgiving dinner. He empowers us to seek out those we've been estranged from. From those who we might need to mend broken relationships with. And that might be a simple phone call and say, Dear brother, I, I'm convicted of, of what happened between us. I hope you can forgive me. And this is just as Christ reconciles us to God. We are called to be agents of reconciliation in our church, in our families, and in our communities. And so what do we do? Well, first, I think we need to commit ourselves to the unity that Christ has already won. He's already won for us. But this means that we, we must humble ourselves. We must set aside our, our pride, our, our grievances, our right to be angry with someone else. To seek reconciliation where there has been division. And we also, we got to be reminded of this, this other essential truth. And that that only happens, it doesn't happen in our own strength. We need to be reminded that this can happen by the power of the one who lives in you. The Holy Spirit has equipped you to do this very work of reconciliation today. Christ, who unites us through his death and resurrection and empowers us to be peacemakers, not peacekeepers, but peacemakers. And he calls us to be reconcilers. And, and as we go in our day today, let us be committed to unity. Let us be committed to unity and sorry, I'm getting a little emotional because I know what you've gone through. But let us be committed to unity. Let us be steadfast. Let us be in reconciliation. Let us be confident that Christ is our reconciler, our unifier, someone that we can rally around and get behind. And he is at work through us as we seek to abide in his word and be united to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Will you pray with me to those ends? Father God, As always, Lord, it is a joy and a privilege to share your word with your church. Lord God, I know there are people here who are still hurting, people who are still in pain. Father God, I know you call us to a hard thing to be united around the gospel message. You call us to be united to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And yet I know also, God, that you have equipped us to do that very thing. I pray, Father God, that your church would consider how to do that. Again, maybe it's a, a simple phone call. Maybe it's taking a brother or sister out to lunch. Maybe it's inviting them over to the house, breaking bread. 
Lord God, I pray that you'd stir the hearts of your people, Lord, to be reconciled to one another, to be reconciled to maybe those who have left the church. Maybe there are people here who have been hurt. It's very real. But Father God, we know that you are the great healer. You are the great provider. And we're called to be united in you. I pray we'd be able to do that this very day. We thank you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.